Okay, this is David Zeeler, director of the Caltech Heritage Project. It is August 20th, 2021. I'm delighted to be here with Professor Richard W. Roll. Dick, it's great to see you. Thank you so much for joining me today. No, well, thank you for inviting me. Dick, to start, would you please tell me your title and institutional affiliation? Uh, I'm in Humanities and Social Sciences, which is uh, one of the divisions, as you know, and I'm the Lind Institute Professor of Finance, uh, and that's my title uh, in that in that uh, division. Tell me about the 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 endowed chair, Lind Institute of, Prof of of Finance. How did that come about? Well, the the Linds um, are a, a couple who he's a Caltech graduate and with a PhD in physics, I believe, and they. Uh, have endowed a number of things at, at Caltech, including, I think they paid for the renovation of the math sciences building recently, and they've given money to various divisions over the years, including um, one at the at, at H and S S, which is my division, for study of uh, financial economics and economics and uh, entrepreneurship, and that that gift uh, to the uh, Lind Institute. Which is not just the chair; it's a, it's a it's a whole institute, which sponsors various things in H and S S. I have uh, I'm part of that. I mean, it, it it's a it's a title it's a chair title, but it really doesn't mean anything in terms of money. <laughs> it's just it's just an honorific uh, title. That's all. Uh, now, Dick, you're a relative newcomer to Caltech. Tell me the the broader story of your decision to transfer here. Uh, well, it's, it's a bit of a long story, but um, I may have told you before that um, I was a professor at UCLA uh, for 38 years, uh, and I that wasn't my first academic job. I'm old. I, I mean, I'll be 82 in October, so it's not I have plenty of time to be places. Uh, so I, I, I came to UCLA in 1976, and I can tell you later why that happened, but, uh, and I was there uh, until five years ago. And the University of California has a, an unusual retirement system in that they provide basically economic encouragement for people who are productive to, re, to resign. They have a, a defined benefit pension plan, which is, which pays you basically your highest three years salary uh, in perpetuity um, if you've been there for 40 years. And it, it builds up every year as a percentage until you get to the 100%, but they won't let you stay in the faculty. In other words, you can stay there, but you don't, it doesn't, doesn't do any good. So, so I thought, you know, being an economist, it, it it wasn't so much that I needed the money, but I felt like an idiot uh, staying there and taking nothing for uh, <laughs> after I'd been there almost 40 years. So I said to my wife, I said, you know, look, we don't really want to leave L.A. Why don't I go and see if I could get another position uh, in, in a local institution and I'll retire and take my pension and then earn you know, the new salary at, at, at the new place. And so I did. And I, I actually got, I, I was surprised that I got offers from, from all three of the leading schools in LA, Caltech, USC, and Chapman down in Orange County. They all offered me a job. So, um, and why was, Caltech, uh, Dick? Why did you choose Caltech? Well, I it mainly is I've always admired Caltech. I mean, it's got a fantastic reputation, as you know, and and uh, I'm kind of, I think of myself as kind of an intellectual and interested in a lot of things other than my chosen field. Um, but it, had, it did have a, have a disadvantage in the sense that there's no business school. I was in the business school at UCLA and I'm a finance professor, so I'm in financial economics. So there was a bit of a, a downside there because Caltech really doesn't have a finance department or a business school. 
But they told me at the time, this is five years ago, that they, they want to build it up and they want to, you know, they want to appoint more people in, in finance in h so that they could provide students with some training in that. A lot of students at Caltech actually, uh, although they start in chemistry and physics and math and computer sciences, they, they end up in their life profession in finance. They go to Wall Street, you know, they become quants and this and that and the other thing. And of course, they don't know anything about it, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> so uh, I think people, certain some people at Caltech at least wanted to to add to that um, to that particular subject because of the fact that so many students were majoring or taking second majors in H and SS with the intention to fall back into a finance career if they didn't get a job in physics or something like that. And uh, and there was at the time a uh, a couple of trustees who were very anxious to pursue this. One was Ron Lind, the, the guy in the Lind Institute, but the other one was Steve Ross, who was a very close, was a very close friend of mine for a long time, a professor at MIT, but he's on the board of trustees when I was appointed. And he was a big, he had a big push on for doing this. Um, and unfortunately he passed away uh, three years ago. So I took the job partly because he encouraged me to do it. <laughs> He, he and I were co-authors on a number of papers and, and longtime friends and colleagues. So, um, I, you know, I knew him very well, but, um, and he was kind of the, the impetus more than anything to get me to, to decide to go to Caltech rather than, you know, USC, which does have a business school and a good one and a, or Chapman, which is a little less attractive because it's a little further away. Dick, coming to Caltech, the fact that it does not have a business school and the fact that obviously so much of Caltech is oriented technically toward the harder sciences, what were your reactions to that intellectually, administratively? Did that change your research agenda? Did it change the kinds of courses you teach? Did it even change the kinds of things you were interested in? Well, it definitely changed the kinds of things I'm interested in. I've met a lot of people at Caltech that uh, in the hard sciences that, uh, that I become friends with and, uh, and occasionally even, you know, have lunch with them, stuff like that, or, or meet them socially, but it didn't change my basic agenda in terms of research. I mean, I'm still doing financial economics and of course in H and SS, we do have economists. So that I have, I have colleagues in H and SS who are, not financial economists, which is one division of economics, but they're economists like, let's say Charles Platt, he does a lot of, you know, uh, uh, models of games and, and stuff like that. He and I have actually written, you know, a paper together. So I've started writing things which are not strictly in my discipline from being exposed to these people. And, uh, you know, I know a lot of people from other divisions since I've come to Caltech, I've become acquainted with them. I mean, I'm interested in physics and chemistry and biology in particular. And so, I mean, David Baltimore, who used to be the, the president of Caltech and I have become pretty good friends. We, we have lunch once in a while. He likes my wine. I have a vineyard, so I give him a bottle of wine once in a while. Where, where is your vineyard? In Ojai, up in uh, Ojai. You know where Ojai is? I, I do. You know. I do. Yeah. Um, I've met other people too, like Francis Arnold, who the Nobel laureate in chemistry, and uh, and Mark Davis, her colleague in chemistry, chemical engineering. Really, he and I worked on a project together uh, briefly. It didn't turn out to be uh, uh, anything, but so I, you know, I have, um, I am exposed to some people. Uh, in other divisions, but I have not really done, uh, I, I've done lots of research since I've come to Caltech. I've continued to publish papers, but they haven't really been in, you know, in astronomy or chemistry or anything like that. <laughs> I don't really know anything about that. I'm, I'm interested in it, but, uh, you know, I have, I have, I have lunch with, uh, 
Mark Davis and Mark Weiss in physics and David Baltimore, you know, we talk about dark matter and, you know, nanoparticles and, uh, <laughs> you know, you know, genetic engineering. And at the end of the lunch, they always ask you, well, which way is the stock market going? <laughs> Well, Mark Wise, as I'm sure you know, has gotten involved in, in some in some financial yeah, he has. issues. Yeah, Mark, yeah, I met him because of another uh, person who was one of his students who is in finance, who's got his own company, used to be at PIMCO down in, in Orange County. And I knew, his, I knew his student, and then I got to meet Mark uh, that way. So, I, you know, I, I know him. Uh, I wouldn't say I'm really close friends with any of these people, but, I, you know, I've I've talked to them and this is know, the intellectual them. environment that you find yeah, yourself yeah. in. You know, so, I, you know, I, I asked Mark Weiss, he, you know, he says, uh, he told me one time, he says, you know, physics, every, all physicists are really depressed. And I said, well, why is that? He, he said, well, dark matter makes up 93% of the universe and we don't know what it is. So we <laughs> think we should. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, financial economists are in the same situation, you know, they don't know which way the stock market is going, but at least they know why they shouldn't. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> you have to be at that level to really appreciate how little we really know, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, Dick, at the outset of our conversation, I'd like to do some nomenclature 101, just to get a sense of where you approach these distinctions. So you've already said the term financial economics. So let's just break that down academically, intellectually, even in the job market and the way people from these varying programs get jobs, what do you see as the discrete differences between finance and economics? And where do you see overlap? Because inevitably there is some between these two fields. Well, I've, I've always thought that, that my field is, a, is really a sub- field of economics it's, it's you know i call it financial economics the the lead the leading journal is a journal of financial economics and and basically the the uh in, in you know my phd at, at chicago was in economics finance and statistics so and i took courses in the economics department and have had many friends in economics at ucla over the over the years including jean laurent who used to be at ucla is a economic historian. So, you know, we, we're all, uh, people in finance are very compatible with anybody in economics. They're closely related areas. I mean, the, the empirical uh, approaches are very similar. They use similar techniques. The math is similar and that sort of thing. So the only difference is that financial economists apply basic economic theory to the study of financial markets and financial decision-making by corporations. That's, there are two main areas in financial economics. One is the study of financial markets, you know, the stock market, the bond market, the foreign exchange market, the, you know, the commodities market, stuff like that. The other is corporations and how they make financial decisions, which has to do with dividend policy, the leverage structure of corporations, the, and that sort of thing. So those two, those, those are the two main areas. But but the the basic approach to doing research in those areas is is very similar to what you do in in economics. And in fact, the you know many people in finance, including myself, publish papers in economics journals, pure economics journals, uh, which they're willing to publish if the paper's good enough. I'm not saying that they're going to accept every one, but but, you know, Charlie Plott, for instance, you know, is, is telling me, he says, you know, the Journal of Finance, which is one of the leading journals in my area, I mean, it's harder to get a paper published in that than in the American Economic Review, you know. So they, partly that's because there are more people in finance than there are economists, you know, because every business school in the country has a finance department, and all those faculty members are trying to get their papers published in, the, in a limited number of finance oriented journals. So they, you know, they, they branch out and publish elsewhere. I've got one coming out um, in the next issue of management science, which is a, which is a, it's a, it's a top journal, but it's mainly devoted to uh, operations research and more technical things than, than pure finance, but they do have a, a finance um, 
associate editor and they try to get finance papers into those journals. So, uh, anyway, the bottom line is I, I, th those fields are closely related. Um, of course, economists also study things like macroeconomics, you know, like the money supply and, you know, the, the, the role of the government and antitrust behavior and all kinds of stuff that financial economists don't usually get involved with. It's really a specialty of, of economics. Dick, as you know, in, 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 in the hard sciences, there's, there's, a, there's a divide between um, applied research and basic research. In other words, basic research is just figuring out how nature works and applied research is using that knowledge towards specific ends. In your fields of interest, and particularly in light of your extensive business experience out in the quote unquote real world, so to speak, where is the value that you've drawn from that experience in applying it academically? And where do you make those intellectual detachments because some of the things that you work on, you are only interested in within an academic context that might not necessarily be connected to the day-to-day -day business world? Well, I think, I think more than the hard sciences, financial economics is more closely connected to the business world. I mean, it is uh, the intention of most people who do research is eventually to turn it into something, a product that can be useful for people in the financial industry. Uh, or in a corporation that's deciding on, let's say, leverage or dividend policy and things like that. So I think, I think most people who do basic research in financial economics have in mind ultimately to turn it into something of practical use. Certainly, that's my case. I mean, I, I although I've done you know some things that are completely useless in terms of uh, practicality. Um, I try to figure out when I'm doing something, well, can, can I use this in, you know, in decision making in some capacity? And, you know, it, and to give you an illustration of that, many financial economists and business schools around the world spend time actually in practice. Like I, I myself went to Wall Street for three years. I took a leave from UCLA and I went to Goldman Sachs in New York City. And I started and was the head of the mortgage securities research group at Goldman Sachs. I started it with them in, uh, back in the 1980s. And so in mortgage, I had, I had worked on interest rates and mortgages uh, and had done empirical papers purely as an academic before that. But what I did at Goldman Sachs is I actually ran a department where we actually traded, you know, mortgages and, and, underwrote uh, collateralized mortgage obligations and invented various kinds of mortgage strip mortgage backed securities and things. So we, uh, you know, in, in my experience, it was not unusual in the sense that a lot of, a lot of professors go, go work at financial institutions. Uh, they take leaves and go work sometimes. Sometimes they don't come back. They make too much money, you know, and then they, they you know, they get wedded to that life and they never come back to, to being an academic, but others do, you know, there's, for example, at, 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 um, at UCLA, I just thinking of two of my colleagues, Francis Longstaff is one and Mark Greenblatt is another that went to work on wall street and, and returned and are now still professors at, at UCLA. Uh, but, um, and there's another one, Andrea Eisfeld went to a hedge fund. She's a younger person. She just went about seven years ago and stayed a couple of years and came back. But there are others that just never, you know, they never come back. They, they go to work for a financial firm, let's say a money management firm, an investment management firm or something like that. And they just, you know, they spend the rest of their lives there or until they retire. Often it's, it doesn't take them that long to amass enough a fair amount of money. Uh, Dick, a really broad historical question that would ask you to survey really the whole of your career, and that is the way that your field culturally has changed in terms of the way that people talk about how wealth should be deployed. 
What have you seen change in the course of your career in that regard? I'm not sure what you mean by culturally. Is that... Uh... What do what, you mean by that? The things that, that, that are talked about, like, for example, now so many, so many corporations emphasize the importance of inclusivity and, and, and environmental values. Talking about well, things... Yeah, that's, that's a much more recent phenomenon. That's just the last couple of years. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, the, you know, it has to do with... Uh, corporations responding to the political environment that's you know, giving them some reason to at least claim they're doing something about those matters, right? Whether they're actually doing anything or not, I'm not, I'm not really sure. Uh, in terms of inclusivity, I mean, that's our, uh, what is, what was the other word you use? The uh, uh, environmental values or stewardship. Environmental, yeah, environmental. There's the environment. So there are firms for example, um, you know the firm, you know the firm BlackRock in mm -hmm. New York City, right? Mm -hmm. Larry Fink is the is the is the chairman of the board of BlackRock. You know him, or do you know? I, him? I know, I know the name. Yes. Yeah. Okay. He's a UCLA graduate, so I know him very well since he was a student, right? Now, so he's when he first went to to New York City, he worked at a company called First Boston. And they specialize in doing mortgage-backed securities in the '80s. And so, when I was in New York doing it for Goldman Sachs, they were all they were a competitor. And I knew him. You know, I've known him for many years. Of course. So he became he started this firm, BlackRock, which has become the world's largest money manager. And in the last couple of years, he started saying, "Well, we need to do something like environment. We need to make sure we invest in environmentally sound." things that are renewable resources and things like that. Uh, so I, I don't really know. I, I, I saw a, a portfolio that BlackRock uh, publicized not long ago, which was a something like the S&P 500, but was more environmentally friendly. And I looked at the, at the composition of that portfolio in the S&P 500, they're not that different, so I'm not sure really what's going on there. You know, he's saying they're he's saying they're investing more in environmentally sound and renewable resources, but uh, it's very hard when you're a that large, let's say the world's largest money manager, not to buy everything that there is, right? That's basically <laughs> you've got to hold just about everything, right? Because uh, Otherwise, every you know, the, it wouldn't make any. You wouldn't have a diversified portfolio. So I, I'm not really sure, really, what those things amount to. But for, but but you know, back to your original question. You know, for let's say I let's I got my PhD in 1968. So from 68, 78, 88, 98, 2008, nothing. There was no mention of any of this inclusivity or environmental stuff. The only thing that's similar to that was that um, there was a period where people were anxious not to invest in South African stocks during the period of apartheid. You remember that? I right? do. Back, yeah. So that was so. So when I was running a, a money management firm with Steve Ross, you know, we had clients that asked us to do that. So we would not buy any companies that were headquartered in South Africa. Well, South Africa is a tiny fraction of the global market index, so it really doesn't matter really whether you have any South African stocks or not. Somebody's going to buy them who who doesn't care about apartheid, but you know, so uh, it really it really doesn't matter too much. We had another client, by the way, who was uh, we had a partner in Saudi Arabia, and we started a mutual fund in Saudi Arabia that appeal to the Muslim world. So it was, it, it only bought stocks that, that uh, would not be restricted under Sharia law, which means that, you know, there's no alcohol, you know, there, there, there are a whole bunch of restrictions like that. But the biggest one is that interest is forbidden under Muslim law. 
you, you can't have interest income or you can't pay fixed interest. That excludes a lot of companies, mm-hmm. right? As you can imagine, we had something like 28,000 stocks that we could buy around the world and only 500 of them qualified for that portfolio. Mm-hmm. So right now you can see, you could you could build a portfolio of 500 stocks that, that has similar risk to the S&P 500, but it's, it's always gonna have some discrepancy there, you know? If you only have stocks that don't have any interest and or pay any interest. <laughs> So I, I would say in the until let's say 2008 or maybe later, those are the only things I noticed about you know practical investing in terms of uh, so this stuff like uh, inclusivity and and so on is, is is really much more recent, and I don't really know how much that really matters. Yeah, yeah. it kind of is like South Africa in a way. You know, it's like you can. You know, you look at BlackRock's portfolio, it looks just like any other portfolio, more or less. You know? Dick, another broad yeah. historical question, but one more germane to your own uh, educational trajectory and, and maybe even intellectual background. And that is your understanding of what the Chicago school is. And the first question there is sort of a chicken and an egg. Can it be assumed that if you want to go to Chicago to study these things that you're already a member or is there a proselytization that you become a member upon successfully graduating or are there people at Chicago who don't ascribe to the Chicago school? How do all of these things work? Okay. The, well, first of all, to, to, to tell you what I understand to be the Chicago school of which I'm a member because I went, I got a PhD there and some of my, most of favorite professors were big shots in the Chicago school. Milton Friedman, for example, you know, I took courses from Milton Friedman and he became a lifelong friend. I knew him for, for, for many years after, even after he retired, he lived in San Francisco. We used to go up for lunch with him, Milton and Rose Friedman. So I, you know, I, and I admired him incredibly. I think he was one of the most brilliant economists that, and he won the Nobel prize and, not only that, he was the best debater I've ever seen in my life. He could take on anybody, Paul Samuelson or anybody else, and just, you know, nail them to the wall. Now, it's true that he would occasionally make up some facts as part of the debate, but, <laughs> but you know, he was, he was a very impressive intellect, I mean, and, and wrote some really fantastic books like Capitalism and Freedom and things like that. So part of the Chicago school, he was one of the main persons, but not the only one. There was, there were, there, you know, there were several other people like George Stigler, who was actually at Chicago, but he was in the business school, not in the economics department. But in Chicago, just like we were talking about earlier about economics and finance, the business school and the, and the economics department are very closely connected. So most people who are getting a PhD at Chicago and either one take courses in the other department. I did, you know, and, and uh, I took courses from Arnold Harberger and from Gary Becker and from Milton Friedman and from a, a bunch of people in the, uh, in the uh, economics department at Chicago. And, and then in the, in the business school, Merton Miller, who's another Nobel laureate who's a finance professor but an economist by training he was in the business school along with stigler and so on so the the whole atmosphere of chicago was the people in the economics department in the finance group in the business school saw agreed pretty much on the on the general way to think about uh, economics and to, to a lesser extent politics and they're free market people you know basic they're I would say they're libertarians, basically. They, they don't like big government. They like freedom to pursue business and do whatever they want. They don't want tell, people telling them uh, what to do. And, they, and they, they, they provided a lot of evidence to the students that the freer the market, the better everybody is off. Uh, even the poor people you know, are better off by being uh, pulled up by the bootstraps, by the by the people who get wealthier. 
And if you look across the world uh, at different countries, you will definitely see that is that the, the, the freer the economy, the less the government intervention, the more prosperous the average person is, even the poor people. So you go to the uh, to one extreme, like let's say Cuba or Venezuela today or Zimbabwe, you know, people are dirt poor. You go to the other extreme, like Luxembourg and Switzerland, they're rich. You know? And of course there are other factors, but if you look at if you look at the main thing, it's you know it's the rule of law and property rights and things like that that the Chicago School was very much in favor of. So your second question is, did you, do people go to Chicago because they're already inclined to believe that? <laughs> well, I didn't, I didn't know anything about it. <laughs> uh, you know, before I went to Chicago, I was an engineer. I, I went to uh, Auburn undergrad. I'm a Southerner by, by the way, I was, I was born in Arkansas and I went to Auburn undergraduate in aeronautical engineering. And I took a degree at um, there at Auburn. And I went to Boeing in Seattle where I was an aeronautical engineer. I didn't have any economics at all prior to that time, but Boeing sent me to become a manager to get an MBA at the university of Washington. And they paid my, they said, we'll pay your tuition. If you go there, of course, tuition in those days was not, not much, but I said, I do it. So I went and I got an MBA at the university of Washington in that was my first exposure to economics and finance. One of the people that I that I had as a professor there was Bill Sharp, who's a Nobel Prize winner in finance. Have you heard that name, William Sharp? Yes. Right? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So, so I've known Bill Sharp longer than anybody else in the whole profession, because I was a student <laughs> when he was an assistant professor, and we're both really old now. You know, I've known him for sixty years or more. <laughs> And uh, so when I graduated from Washington, I, I, I went to see him and another professor and said, you know, I like this economics and finance a lot better than engineering, you know, designing a hinge for a 727 or something like that, which is what I was doing. Where should I go to school? I said, I, th I was thinking about going to Harvard. And Bill, he, he said, that's horrible. Don't ever think about going to Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> but in Chicago, that's where they're doing the, the best work. So to, 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 so to answer your question, I certainly wasn't, <laughs> didn't know anything about the Chicago school before I got there. Uh, but, you know, they pretty much took me in and persuaded me that they had a good idea uh, while I was there. And um, three years later, I graduated with a PhD and I really haven't changed my mind that much over these years. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, Dick, among my more uh, current questions, that is right up to this present day. What are you currently working on now, just as a snapshot in time? Uh, well, I, I, I'm just working today on a paper on, um, it's, it's kind of a, st a statistics paper, really. It's a, But it has an application to finance. It has to do with... Um, non-stationary expected returns, which means that returns change over time for various reasons. For example, a, a company becomes more leveraged or for many reasons, you know, mean returns change, the risk profile of the company changes and so on. And what what I what this paper is is to is showing that when those mean returns are non-stationary, the serial correlation coefficient of observed returns can be spuriously positive. And the serial correlation coefficient is something that traders look to, to, to devise a trading rule. So for example, if, if stock returns are dependent from period to period, you can build a trading rule that will make money during that. Right? But what, what the changing expected returns do is they induce positive serial dependence, but it's not something you can make money on. So it's a paper that kind of warns practitioners not to just look at the serial correlation coefficient as a possible way to make money, because there's there's another reason that it can happen uh, that, that will not allow you to make money. So that paper, um, 
I'm just finishing it up now. Um, we first show why that happens, you know, we, so we have both theoretical algebraic explanations for it and, uh, and empirical simulations. And then we look to see whether or not there's empirical evidence that this actually happens in the real stock market. And there we look at changes over time and mean returns and relate that to serial dependence. And we do find that it's quite, it's quite prevalent. So it's something that people should be careful about when they devise trading rules. How has your research been affected by the pandemic? Have you found opportunity to be more productive just from being at home? Has it been difficult not to have that in-person interaction with, with, with your colleagues and students? Well, I, I didn't think it would make much difference, but when I look back on it now, I think it has. Because I haven't done as much over the last two years as I had typically been doing. Of course, I have a, an identification problem because my age may be partly responsible for this as well, right? I may be just slowing down because I'm in my early 80s. I mean, most people in their 80s don't publish that much, but uh, and I was publishing pretty good clip for uh, a long time. But I've the last two years, I have not, I have not done as much. And I don't know whether it's because I'm just not going to Caltech and seeing, you know, all my colleagues and friends in the in the division or and getting good ideas and things like that. I think maybe partly that is true. If you, if you hang around the building and talk to people, you know, and go to seminars and well, you know, we don't have any seminars now because nobody's, nobody's there and there's no you know, visiting. So there, we used to have a finance seminar every two weeks, which has not, which we not, we haven't had uh, for the last well, I guess since January of 2020, right? I, I guess it's been, what was that, about 19 months now, something like that? Yeah, it feels uh, a lot longer, though. <laughs> yeah, it feels like it's been forever. But, uh, you know, and I've taught three times since, since then uh, using uh, Zoom. You know, I taught three classes over that, over that period. Um uh, but I don't find that very satisfactory either because the, you know, the students half the time they, they mute their, their video and you can't, you can't see them. Yeah. And then when you ask them not to mute it, they say, well, we don't want to unmute it because we're still in our pajamas, you know? <laughs> so, like, <laughs> and I, I don't really know. I mean, I, I thought they weren't getting much out of these courses, but they still do pretty well in the, on the exam. So I guess, I, I don't know whether that's just good Caltech student quality or what. But they, they seem to be doing all right, but I, you know, it, it kind of surprises me in a way because they don't, they don't, they, they don't interact nearly as much as they do in person. Maybe others have told you that. I don't know. But, yeah. Well, Dick, let's take it all the way back to the beginning. Let's start first with your parents. Tell me a little bit about them. Well, this is a long story. I don't know whether you want to listen to all this. Or Absolutely. Not. That's what I'm here for. <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, I was born in 1939, Halloween, 1939, right before the Second World War. My mother was a nurse, and so when the war broke out, she was recruited to go off, you know, in, to the military in the, during the war. I, I think she spent most of the time in the Pacific. I'm not really sure, but her parents, my maternal grandparents, basically raised me during the World War II, and I didn't really know my own mother that well until the end of the war when I was about, I guess, six years old or so, and she came back. My Her sister, my Aunt Ebby, lived with, my, with her parents, my maternal grandparents, and we all lived together, um, and her husband, Ebby's husband, was off in the war as well. He was in Italy in the Air Force. 
So it was kind of a fractured thing. Now, my grandparents um, on my mother's side, their name was Roll, but my mother had been married to a person named Whittington. So when I was born, my name, my birth certificate said Richard Whittington. Now, here's where the story gets a little bit unbelievable. My grandmother told me that Richard Whittington, the person who was married to my mother, was not my real father. She she said that my real father, my mother had an affair with a Cajun shrimp boat captain. We're in Louisiana, by the way. Where in Louisiana? <laughs> named, yeah, named, named Richard Basco, and that he was my father. <laughs> and Dick, where in Louisiana was your family? Well, this was in Abbeville, Louisiana. I don't know if you, it's near Lafayette. Okay. You know, it's a little town. So. Uh-huh. So it's, uh, we didn't live there all the time because my, my grandfather, my paternal grandfather was a railroad executive. And so when I was about seven or so, we moved to St. Louis where he was the head of the Western District of the Missouri Pacific. And then we moved around and to a couple of other places, including St. Joe, Missouri, and so on. But basically, I grew up, uh, and they're all Southerners, you know, my my parents and my. So, so here's the here's the here's the strange thing. I believe that my real father was this Cajun named Richard Basco. I believed that all my life until I was until about five years ago. Five years ago. I did one, two, three, and me. Oh, wow. And so I put my, the reason I did that is my cousin, one of my cousins, who's my, who's Ebby's, my, 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 my mother's sister child is a doctor in Northern California. And he did it. And he said, why don't we try it? You do it. So if, see if they really identify that we're first cousins, right? So I did it and they did. They showed us the first person that came up was Jeff, my cousin. Right? But then about six months later, another person came up that shared 25% of my genes with me. Somebody named Susan Charest in Arkansas. And so I contacted her through. So I was, I was saying, how can I, that's, that means she's my half sister or my, or my own child, but I don't have any children that I don't know about. So I thought maybe my own son had had a, a child. He hadn't told me <laughs> my son, by the way, is 58. So he, <laughs> that could have been the case, <laughs> except that this person, Susie was also was already in her fifties. So I got in touch with her and and I said, who are you, by the way? How, how are we related? She said, I'm your half-sister. My father is Richard Whittington, and he was your real father. Wow. And then I discovered, was from Susie, my my newly discovered half-sister, that my, my maternal grandparents and my mother and everybody in my family had lied to me since the time I was a, a child, they claimed he died. He lived into the 1960s, and I never had a chance to meet him, my real father. And so she started, Susie sent me a lot of pictures of him and things like that. So it turns out that Richard Basco was not, my grandmother was was wrong. She may have thought he was my but, but actually my real father was my mother's husband. Hey, now, Here's the funny thing is that I had four cousins from my maternal side of the family, but my real father was the youngest of eight children. And I have 17 cousins from his side of the family. And my grandfather, my maternal, my paternal grandfather was the pastor of the biggest Baptist church in Arkansas and a very well-known political figure in there. I never knew any of this until I was in my late seventies. Can you believe that? That's, that is, wow. Huh? What, what did you feel about having been denied the opportunity to meet your real father? Well, I, you know, 
I I was really mad. Yeah. Because I could have had a good relation. He he turned out to be, according to my half sister, a really great person. And in my maternal family, basically kept me away uh, from that. I never had a chance. He was in the army in World War II, by the way, uh, and came back after the war. But of course, I was born right before the war, so. My mother was married to him, you know, at least briefly. They got a divorce, and then my, the people on my maternal side never told me a thing about it, although they knew it. But I'm, I'm still mad, but what can I do? Yeah. They're all, all, everybody that knew about it is gone, right? Yeah. So you can't, you can't do a thing about it. Dick, do you have any early memories, having a sense, even as a very young child, of the United States being in World War II? Yeah, yeah, I knew about it quite. I, I have pretty vivid memories of, I guess, when I was maybe four or so, my grandfather would take me out in the yard and show me a whole flight of bombers going over, flying to Europe, uh, stuff like that. And then I, I remember very well, at the, right at the into the war, I guess it was VJ Day, or I guess Japan was after Germany, was it? Uh, yeah, they sort of, I got to ride on a fire truck. There's a big celebration. <laughs> I remember doing that. That was the highlight of the war. <laughs> but I had, I had, um, you know, I had several relatives that were in the war. My mother, of course, was somewhere. My uncle Frank, who was my aunt's husband. He was in Italy in World War II. I had another cousin who was killed in Tarawa. So I knew, you know, there was, I knew people um, who were in the, in the battle, but I don't remember much except watching these bombers fly overhead and, and riding on the fire truck. And what was the circumstance of the family moving to St. Louis? My, my, my grandfather, um, my maternal grandfather, uh, was transferred there because he became an exec. He was an executive for the Missouri. Actually, started with the Texas and Pacific. That was in Louisiana, railroad executive, and then he became the chief superintendent of the Western District of the Missouri Pacific Railroad, which extended from St. Louis to Kansas City to Denver. So we moved to St. Louis, where he supervised that segment of the Missouri Pacific. He had his own railroad car, his own private car. We used to, he used to, we used to go, he used to take me on the, on the, he'd hook his car up to the end of a passenger train, the Colorado Eagle, and we'd go to Colorado and they'd put us, our car in the, in the siding next to a trout stream and we'd go fishing. He was a great, he was a great to, to me, <laughs> except he didn't tell me about my father, but <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought he was the, I still think he's the greatest, one of the greatest persons I've known, and one of the smartest. Uh, and my my maternal parents, uh, grandparents, legally adopted me toward the end of the war. So they they actually went to court and and got me got my birth certificate changed. Why they did that, I still am not sure. I guess maybe to keep me away from the this father, which they didn't like but i i'm not sure exactly why that happened but anyway that they did that and you spent your childhood in, in st louis no i i spent the first few years in louisiana and then a couple of years in st louis a couple of more years in in kansas city because that was kind of midway on the route of the missouri pacific and then my grandfather basically retired, but he didn't retire. He became the president of a small railroad that was headquartered in St. Joe, Missouri. And so I lived, I, when I when I got to high school, we had moved to St. Joe, Missouri. That's where I went to high school. I graduated from Central High School in St. Joe. Um, and from there, I went to Auburn, um, you know, entered the aeronautical engineering program. I, I also had a Naval ROTC scholarship to Auburn. Uh, 
but I went back south for the for college. And in high school, were you more technically oriented? Were you stronger in math and science? That's what you knew you wanted to pursue a, an undergraduate program in? Well, I was good in everything. You know, I was good in that. I had good grades. I actually skipped the fourth grade because I was the, 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 the teacher said I was already done every the material. So I, when I, when I graduated from high school, I was only 16 years old when I went to Auburn and four years later, I was only 20. So naval to be a naval officer, you have to be 21. So they excused me. Uh, and I didn't actually, they didn't need anybody anyway in the Navy. This is 1960. So that was before Vietnam and so on. So there's somebody with a blower outside here. I'm going to shut the window. Sure. These blowers drive me nuts. I don't know why people use them. They're the worst. Yeah. So anyway, I, I, since I was only 20 when I graduated from college, I, I didn't go in the Navy, and I, uh, but I took a job at Boeing. So they, they actually took, the Navy told me that if I go to work for a defense contractor, they just forget the whole thing. So I did. Uh, and I was lucky because a few years later, Vietnam came along and if I had been in the, I, I was actually a Marine Corps option. I, I went to Quantico between my junior and senior year and trained in the boot camp at Quant for officer training school. But because when you're in Naval RTC, every summer you go on a cruise or something like that. So I, the, between freshman and sophomore, I went to Europe on a, on a cruiser between sophomore and junior, I flew from a, from Pensacola and then between junior and senior, I went to officer candidate school in, in Quantico, but uh, I never went in active duty. Dick, did you have a good experience at Auburn? Yeah, I, I, I liked Auburn. I, it, it was, I had some really good uh, aeronautical engineering professors who worked at Redstone Arsenal, who, which you know is the, where the um, Redstone Arsenal is where they brought Werner von Braun from World War II to yeah. develop rockets and stuff like that. So there are some people teaching aeronautical engineering who were also working at, at, at Redstone Arsenal. And the funny thing is, is when I, when I went to work at Boeing, I worked briefly in the airplane division, but then I started working in the missile division. So the third year I was at Boeing, I wrote the operating manual for the moon rocket the rocket that went to the moon. Um, Boeing built the first stage booster for that for the moon rock. I don't know if you know that or not. I but did not know three that. Three stages. So this this gigantic first stage thing was it's just a big tank with giant pumps to pump the oxygen and 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 uh, kerosene into the combustion chambers. And you know it's just Oh, you can't believe how big it is, but they built it in Metairie, Louisiana. So I was back in, I was back in New Orleans when I worked for Boeing on that thing. They, they, they had to build it there because it's, it was too big to transport except by a barge. And so they, they, when they sent it to Cape Canaveral to shoot it off to the moon, it was transported from Metairie, Louisiana on a barge to Cape Canaveral. That's how they got the thing there. So. Dick, at Auburn, was was it integrated at that point? What was your sense of the racial politics there? No, there were no black students there. When, when, I, when I first went there, I, there were none. In fact, the first year I was there, which is 1957, the Auburn football team was won the national championship. No black players. And then a, and then a few years later, when Alabama played USC, I think it was, there was a player for USC, a black player who was named Sam Cunningham, who just killed Alabama. And at that point, Bear Bryant and Shug Jordan at Auburn and Alabama said, we're going to stop this nonsense about white players. And they, you know, they started letting black 
players into the school. I, I was I was the editor of the school paper though. So I was a, I, I wrote, uh, I worked as part-time as a news editor and, and editorial writer. And then when I was a senior, I was the editor of the school, of the Plainsman, which is a school paper. How long were you at Boeing? Four years. Did you specifically want to go back to graduate school? Why didn't you stay longer and develop a career at Boeing? Well, as I told you, they sent me to get an MBA. Mm -hmm. And I... With I the intention of coming back to grow within the company. Yeah, though. yeah. So I, w I was actually working full time while I was getting the MBA. They wanted me to be, uh, to be an engineering manager. And they thought that I needed, you know, business training to, to do that. And, but then when I, when I went to University of Washington to the business school, I liked the things that I was studying there better than I liked engineering. So I decided, Hey, you know what? I think I'm going to switch fields. What yeah. specifically, what, what resonated with you in the MBA program? Oh, just, just economics and finance. I mean, I like studying the stock market. I like, I like the counting, you know, that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, even, even though I, I had an interesting job at Boeing, like the last year I was working on the moon rocket. That was, that was interesting, but you know, it, it basically I was writing a manual that was describing how a gigantic turbine pump can pump liquid oxygen into a combustion chamber. And I didn't feel like that was anywhere near as interesting as the stock market. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, you know what, if I have a chance, I might as well try something different. You know? how, much, um, how much opportunity did you have to take, you know, like Econ 101? Tell me about the curriculum for the MBA at Washington. Yeah, there, Econ 101, you had to take an economics course. Uh, that that economics course was what we call an economics price theory. It was basically supply and demand, and you know the basics of things. And then I started taking more advanced electives, like just Bill Sharp was teaching a course in in finance, which was uh, basically concentrating on risk risk and return, how you measure risk and 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 how you quantify risk and whether or not the, that quantification leads to higher average returns for stocks. And he wrote, uh, when he was there, when he was an assistant professor, he wrote a paper which he published in 1964 about the capital asset pricing model, which is called a CAPM by people in the field, for which he won the Nobel Prize. He was very excited about that paper, I remember in class. And so he was, he, his, his enthusiasm, you know, infected everybody in the class. I didn't really know what he was talking about. <laughs> but, but it was not until I got to Chicago that I realized, hey, this is really good stuff, you know. <laughs> Did you go back to Boeing and say, I'm so sorry that you spent all this money on me, but I'm going to pursue an academic career? Or how did that conversation play out? Yeah, I, yeah, I, I gave him notice and said, I'm, you know, I, I don't want to be an engineer anymore. And, and my, my supervisor you know, said, well, you know, you're making a big mistake, but, you know, they didn't try to talk me out of it. I, I was one of many engineers at Boeing. I mean, they, you know, they're a dime a dozen, so it's not a huge loss for a company like that. Boeing is, is a gigantic company in terms of the engineers. You know? I don't know how many thousand, but at least, let's say 30,000 engineers, something like that. Where did you think about going to pursue the PhD? What options did you have? Well, I think I told you a little while ago that I, you know, I, since I was a Southerner, nobody advised me about which colleges were good and which were bad. I knew nothing about anything. But then when I got to, to Washington, you know, I started hearing about better schools. You know, I was suddenly aware that there's a college called Harvard, you know, Princeton, you know, Yale. <laughs> I never even heard of Harvard, you know, when I was a kid. <laughs> 
So I said, hey, you know what? Harvard sounds good. Let me apply to Harvard, right? And that's when I went to Bill Sharp and another professor in Chicago and said, you know, I think I'm going to go to Harvard to get my PhD. And they they looked horrified. They said, no, don't ever go to Harvard. They said, go to Chicago. That's where the, the real research is happening, right? And uh, so I changed my mind. I had applied to Harvard and was admitted there. And, and uh, but you know the Harvard Business School is is did not have the best reputation in those days. It was a case studies st uh, school. They did not do quantitative research or any kind of you know scientific research. They just studied cases. I didn't know that, of course, but Sharp did, and he told me, you know, you know, don't you go to Harvard? He said that's that's the wrong place if you want to. If you want to be a professor, you know, you got to learn how to do research, you know, not, not write cases. And that was very good advice because I certainly made the right choice. I mean, I don't say that Harvard was, that Chicago was the only place. I mean, I could have gone to Stanford or maybe Wharton or a few places that were, you know, had similar mindsets about doing research, but Harvard was the wrong place. At Dick, least in those days, it's changed now. But uh, while you're making these decisions, are you exempt from the draft? Were you thinking about enlisting? What was where was Vietnam in all of this for you? Well, I was not exempt from the draft, but as as I mentioned to you before, I was in Naval ROTC in college, right? And and but and then since they didn't really need anybody in the Navy. In 1960, when I graduated, there was no war going on. The Korean War was over. The Vietnam War had not started. You know, it, it really didn't get underway until, I don't know, 63 or four, something like that. So there was a there was a surplus of Naval and Marine Corps officers. So they were letting people go, especially if they would tell them that, that they would go to work they promised to go to work for a defense contractor. So when I worked for a Boeing, that was a defense contractor, right? And basically, as long as you work for a defense contractor in those days, you didn't, you didn't get drafted. There was no draft really until Vietnam got underway. Mm -hmm. Nobody was being drafted mm -hmm. in those days. Mm -hmm. So I was, as I, I was lucky because I escaped that, uh, and then when I got to Chicago as a PhD student, uh, it was still a little early. Then when I when I graduated, I went to Carnegie where I took my first academic job. I at that time I was married and had two children, um, so I got a deferment from Vietnam for that. Uh, you know, they used to give people exemptions if they were married and had children. I don't know if they still do that or not. But anyway, I never went in. Dick, what were your impressions when you first got to Chicago, both of the city and the university? Well, I definitely was not impressed by the city. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the first month I was there, I was in married student housing, and I, uh, I walked out one morning. There was a bus stop in front of the building where, I, where my apartment was, and there was a guy laying in the in the bus stop with a bullet hole in his head and a guy with a gun standing over. And there were about seven or eight people gathered around. They didn't seem to be that bothered by it. The police came and it turned out that the guy on the ground was a robber. He had come to the bus stop and, start, and pulled out a gun and started holding up people. But one of the people in the crowd had a gun. They shot him right in the head. This guy had a permit for the gun. And the police said, okay, you got the permit. And took the witness and said, everybody but got on the bus and went to work, you know. So, I was like, God. so you know, it was Chicago, the south side of Chicago, where the University of Chicago is, is, is basically surrounded by a not a very nice neighborhood. I mean, it's uh, scary. It was probably scarier in those days than it was today, but, you know, it's not. And then the weather, okay? Here's a boy from Louisiana, yeah. right? 
Yeah. I get up one morning, I had a Ford Falcon parked out in front of the building. The snow that night was so much that I could walk right over the top of the Ford Falcon, but that even, you know, <laughs> it took me a week to dig it, to it out. <laughs> so I didn't, I didn't care for the weather or the city, but I loved the university. You know, yeah. that, that was, you know, you go to the university and that you're in a, this little Shangri-La of intellectual people that are just doing their best to do good research. That was that was an incredible thing. And Dick, when did it dawn on you that there was such a thing as the Chicago School and that you would become an adherent to it? Well, I knew I was becoming an adherent to it. I didn't know it was a Chicago School or they were call they call it that. I only heard that when I left. When I later got to Carnegie, you know, and they said, oh, you're from Chicago, the Chicago school. And I said, what's that? He said, well, oh, you know, that's all the guys at Chicago, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but you know, the, the, it, I don't know who gave it that name originally, but it, it was because they, there were a lot of people, mainly the economics department, also the business school that, you know, that were believed in free markets and low taxes and they had a certain point of view and it was not Keynesian, right? It was anti-Keynesian. That's, that's the Chicago school stands for that, right? More because you remember the, the old days, you know, John Maynard Keynes, the Cambridge economist, you know, he had become so paramount in, in the way the government worked. Everybody in the federal government believed they should do what Keynes said. And Chicago said, no, that's not the right way to behave you know milton Friedman is one of the leading lights in that thing but uh but i knew people who were keynesians like paul samuelson you know who, who paul samuelson is? of course yeah. sure yeah so when i graduated from chicago my dissertation won a prize as the best american dissertation in economics business school student and it was it was published as a book and Paul Samuelson was on the committee and he called me and he'd like to bring forward to the book. Which he did. So I got to know Paul Samuelson. He was, he was a great person. Oh, Dick, I think you're, you're touching the microphone on the computer. I, I missed what you said. I was talking about Paul Samuelson. Did you hear that? Yeah, I got I got that far, and then the mic the the microphone started rubbing something rubbing on the microphone. It's fine oh, now. You must you must have been touching something. Okay, I'll, I don't know what I was touching, but anyway, how's that sound now? Perfect. Okay, so I got to know some people at other schools because even when I was a student, I was writing papers with the professors, and I would go around to present them. I went to MIT and I met Paul Samuelson, who was in the economics department at MIT, and Franco Medigliani, who was also an econ department. It was a co-author of Merton Miller, who was on my committee. Uh, so I got to know some people at other places. And then when I when I graduated, I went to I went to Carnegie, which in those days was called Carnegie Institute of Technology. Now it's Carnegie Mellon. That was my first academic job. And uh, I had some no-name economists as colleagues there, like Bob Lucas and Ed Prescott, both of whom are Nobel Prize winner. You know, Tom Sargent, also a Nobel Prize winner. They were all faculty members at, at Carnegie. But I was the only finance professor because they, even though they had a business school, they were all economists. So they didn't know anything about finance. I ended up teaching, you know, all the finance courses at, at Carnegie for six years. Dick, what was the intellectual process of developing your, your thesis research? Well, I worked with Jean Fama, who was my thesis principal advisor, although he, I, I was, had other people on my committee Merton Miller, Ruben Kessel, and Arnold Zellner. Zellner is an econometrician, so he's not a finance guy. The other three are finance guys. And Gene Fama had written a bunch of papers about the stock market and serial dependence 
in stock returns, which is the thing that I told you about earlier in the paper I was just writing about. Um, but nobody had done any work on interest rates. And so he suggested that I collect data on, on interest rates and try to see what the empirical behavior was of interest rates. The trouble was there's, there was no database on interest rates. We had, we had developed a database, Chicago had developed a database on stock returns, but not on interest rates. And so I had to, I had to go to New York City to Salomon Brothers and dig through their archives and collect a data set of treasury bill rates, which are the empirical uh, things that I used in my dissertation. And I, I basically wrote a book called The Behavior of Interest Rates, which, which describes how the term structure evolves over time and you know whether or not there's any way to make money on the movements in the term structure and that, and that kind of thing. And that was what was in my, uh, I had some theory in there about that too, because there were, there are theories of the term structure of interest rates, um, going back to the mid thirties, Irving Fisher, for instance, talks about, uh, the, the term, the term structure of interest rates is the relation between the turn to maturity of a bond and the, and the yield on the bond. And that term structure fluctuates over time. If you could predict that you could make a lot of money on that prediction. So I, I did study that in the, in, in my dissertation, but the reason for that really was we were just looking around for all kinds of ways to apply these new techniques to different financial markets. And nobody had done treasury bills and short-term interest rates before. So I, you know, I, I dug into that and, you know, produced a book really that, uh, was pretty comprehensive study of, of that. Who else was on your thesis committee? Well, I mentioned Arnold Zellner, who's an econometrician, which, so he's a guy that knows a lot of statistics and, and, that, and that sort of thing. Merton Miller, who is a finance professor, but Nobel Prize winner, deceased now, but he uh, he's, his main specialty is corporate finance, that is leverage and dividend policy and things like that. Not so much stock market behavior. Gene Fama, who is, was my dissertation chairman, who is still at Chicago. He's a, also a Nobel prize winner. Mm -hmm. He's a lifelong friend of mine. He, his wife and my wife are like bosom buddies and he spends six months a year in LA because he just wants to get out of Chicago. <laughs> uh, so we have dinner with them quite often. Uh, he's, he's only a year older than me. He just graduated a year before I did actually mm -hmm. and joined the faculty at Chicago right from graduate schools. They very unusual to somebody appoints a PhD student of the faculty, but they were right about him because he was, he's been brilliant and, I think he's the most cited person in, in economics. He has more citations than anybody else. I believe that's the case. At least that was a couple of years ago. Um, and, you know, we, he and I wrote several papers together. We, we wrote, when I was a graduate student, we wrote three papers together and published them in the, uh, one of whom, one of which was a, has become one of the most cited papers in finance. It has to do with event studies, mm -hmm. which I don't need to go into, but it, it's, well, what uh, is, what is an event study? Event study is a study where you, where you, you take stocks that do the same thing, but at different points in time, suppose they announce a dividend increase. They don't all do that at the same moment. So what you do is you look to see what the price reaction is to a dividend increase. But of course, if you look at a single stock, there are lots of other things going on. There's a lot of noise in the data. So what you do in an event study is you line up all these different stocks. You, you find a sample of companies that have done the same thing, announce a dividend increase, and you line them up on the date of the dividend increase announcement. And by doing that, you, you 
wash out all the noise of other things that happen to the stock so that you're left with only a pure measure of the dividend increase. So that's basically the first dividend study. The first event study was one that we did together when I was a graduate student. There have been thousands of them since then because everybody wants to do this since they're all interested in well, what happens if I split the stock? What if I, what if I do a merger, you know, who, you know, everything that a stock can do, <laughs> you can check it, just check what the effect is by doing an event study, right? So anything you can imagine is by now has been done, at least with the previous data, you know, you need to redo it every now and then because things change, but, uh, but basically it's a way of, of trying to isolate a particular event that happens. And the reason you need to do that is there's so much other noise going on in companies that every day the stock goes up or down for many other reasons. And so what you need to do is to wash out all that noise to try to figure out what, what is the effect of this particular action on, on the price of the stock. Dick, at least informally, how important is it for you to consider psychology, sociology, when you consider these things? Well, for a long time, I didn't think it was important at all. Because, um, you know, and that's my Chicago school training. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There's a market, right? And in a market, any market, there are thousands of people buying and selling, right? So when you think about the market price, what that is is a an indication of the consensus belief of all the buyers and sellers who are inhabiting that market. They're all all the buyers think they're the price is too low, and all the sellers think the price is too high. But you know, there's wisdom in the crowd. That's that's the idea of the market, mm -hmm. right? Is mm -hmm. that that price is probably just about right. In fact, the empirical studies show that that's the case when you have a really well-functioning market with lots of competitors in the market, you, you, you rarely find a situation where the price is completely wrong. Now, ex post, it's going to be wrong because new information comes out, you know, but nobody knew that at the time, right? So new information will, of course, change the price, but since that information isn't known to the market, participants at, you know, at the beginning, only later, that's a surprise that, that, that moves the price. So the, so the essence of market efficiency, which is what Gene Fama popularized, is that the market price of a stock is always an unbiased estimate of the future value of the stock. Sometimes it's too high and sometimes it's too low, but on average, it's right. And what that means also is that the only thing that changes the price is a surprise in terms of information. You know, tomorrow the CEO had a heart attack. Boom, the stock price falls. But nobody knew he was going to have a heart attack the day before, right? So that that new information is the only thing that should really affect a market price um, at all. And if there's no new information, the price should just stay basically pretty much where, where it is. Now, psychologists, you know, the people that are doing psychological things don't believe that. They think that, you know, there's a bargain every day, right? The only problem is, you know, that, that because of psychological factors, you know, some people bid the price up too high, or maybe the price is too low. You know, trouble is, how do you deter? How do you detect that? Mm -hmm. How do you detect which one, is, which it is? So I, I for a long time I thought, well, really there's not much scope in finance for psychological things because markets are operating pretty efficiently. But I, I realized after a while though there are some cases in finance, some situations where there's not a market. There, you know, that you don't have thousands of buyers and sellers coming into a marketplace and bidding up or down the price and, and, and putting into the price their best estimate of the information that's available. Uh, and, and a good example of this is in a merger where a company 
wants to take over another company, an acquisition, let's say. So Microsoft wants to acquire Yahoo, let's say. That That's a situation where there's only one or two people making the decision. There's not a lot there. There isn't a whole market there. Yahoo's selling for a certain price in the market, but Microsoft thinks that price is too low. And if they believe that and they're willing to pay more, you know, they can they can pay the stockholders of Yahoo more than their current market price is, right? So the question then comes up in mergers in general. Is it possible that that people who are over enthusiastic or overestimate the value of the target in an acquisition, are they wrong most of the time? And the reason you suspect that might happen is that suppose you have a publicly traded company like Yahoo and Microsoft says, I'd like to acquire that. So let me do a valuation of Yahoo. And they and Yahoo's selling for thirty dollars a share. When Microsoft does a valuation, it comes up to only twenty five dollars a share. You never see a bid. You only see a bid when the valuation exceeds the current price. Right? So basically, you've lopped off half the distribution, and only the people who have overestimated the price are the ones who make the acquisition which means that they generally lose. So when when a, when a acquirer acquires a target, the market generally reacts by the price of the asset to acquire because they realize they've over. Oh, Dick, the the microphone thing is happening again. Oh, sorry. So let's say let's say Microsoft makes a bid for Yahoo. What happens to the stock of Microsoft, the price of Microsoft? It goes down on the announcement because the market assumes that Microsoft has overestimated the value of Yahoo. So when you, when you do empirical studies of many different acquisitions using an event study again, right? you can, this is an event, an, an announcement of an acquisition, you can see that the effect of the announcement that, that the company is going to acquire another public company is to reduce the value of the acquiring company. But that's rational, right? But it's rational from the market's point of view, but it's irrational from the acquiring CEO's point of view, because he's, he's either got hubris or you know, overweening pride and arrogance that his valuation is right and the market is wrong. So that's there's psychology for you, right? And there is hubris. You know, there are people with hubris, right? They think they're right and here's a market. They think that's wrong. And that's a case where you actually see it uh, empirically because unlike a general stock market trading every day, you know, there's one person or just a small number of people who make that acquisition decision. And they don't make that many of them in their whole lifetime. Right? And they're not, so they don't learn that much, typically. Uh, so, so you can, you can trace uh, psychological effects from, from that. I also wrote another paper where I looked at um, <clears throat> overconfidence in, um, in, in mergers and acquisitions. And in that case, there's, um, there's kind of, there's evidence that, um, if you, if you are overconfident or narcissistic, you have a, an effect on the negotiations between two companies in a merger. This isn't just like an acquisition, but let's say two pretty much equal sized companies are they're, they're talking about merger and one CEO is more narcissistic than the other CEO. And what narcissism is, well, you know what narcissism is. It's a psychological, you know, if you look at psychology, they, they have a whole list of characteristics, you know, that 
self-centered and, and this kind of stuff. But so what, what we did in this paper is we actually measured the narcissism of CEOs in merger contests. Mm. And we did that by looking at the fraction of first person pronouns they use in transcripts when they give us interview. So if you say a lot of I instead of we, you're more narcissistic. Mm. And psychologists have, see, have shown that that's actually a pretty closely correlated with their standard tests of narcissism. They, their, their big tests that, you know, include all kinds of other factors. If you look at the transcripts of interviews given by uh, CEOs, the fraction of first person pronouns used is a very good measure of narcissism. So if you have two companies, one of which is more narcissistic than the other, the impact on the negotiations affects which one is more narcissistic which one is going to hold out the longest for the best price, which one is going to insist on their price. And if both are equally narcissistic, it takes a lot longer to do the deal. It, you know, they can't come to an agreement. So, so there, there is some scope for psychology in some of this, you know, although in generally it's, it's, I don't, I don't, I'm not a, uh, much of a believer in behavioral finance, but mm -hmm. you know, I don't deny that it exists. Speaking of psychology and sociology, being in Chicago in 1968, what was that like in terms of the riots, in terms of the convention? Where were you in all of these things? Well, I was at the, on the campus, so the the 68 riots were downtown at the convention center. At the you know, that's the was it the Democratic nomination when the, yeah so. Yeah, I mean, it's 60 blocks away, but so we didn't feel that close to it. But, uh, you know, we followed on TV, of course, but that's like anybody did in those days. I didn't you, feel were, like you were not very politically engaged at that point. No. In fact, you know, the, the, you, know you know, the Chicago school is not really very politically engaged. It's, it's, it's libertarian, it's more libertarian, which, you know, neither the Republicans or Democrats, you know, <laughs> appeal to those guys. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, when you have the Republicans, they're spending like crazy, just like the Democrats. So, you know, the, the, like the, uh, in, in Washington, you know, you really can't tell the difference between which which administration is in power they're they're all spending trillions of dollars yeah right? yeah now there were people uh i you probably have heard that there were some people in chicago that got involved in the political um situation in other countries for example in chile uh, arnold harberger became a leading advisor to pinochet the dictator in chile and so he got castigated for doing this, even though under Pinochet, Pinochet was basically a hands-off guy when it came to the economy. He let the minister of finance and the head of the central bank basically manage the country. And the country had a boom, you know, an economic, economic prosperity in Chile became incredible under Pinochet, even though it, he was repressive in terms of his political. There was no voting or anything, but it's kind of like, it kind of reminds me of Hong Kong when the British were there. There was no voting, but, you know, Hong Kong became richer than England you know, because it was able to, because they were, the, the British administrator just basically let the Hong Kong people do whatever they, they felt like doing and the taxes were low. So Pinochet was bad guy. You know, he didn't allow p political um, representation, but he let the economists run the country. And Chile became the richest country by far in Latin America mm. in, that, in that period. Well, Harberger was the advisor to these economists who were in charge of, under Pinochet. So he got kind of castigated in the press for having helped them. Um, and, you know, I, I think, 
I don't know whether that was justified or not. He he did help a a government that was headed by that dictator, but the Chilean people did very well under under that in terms of economic prosperity. Dick, after you defended, what what opportunities were available to you, and was it only academic uh, opportunities that you were looking for? Did you consider all going into into the the world of finance? Yeah, I considered it, um, and I did have I did have offers to go to to Wall Street to Salomon Brothers, and to a few banks like a bank in Chicago or the the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, which trades. Uh, options and futures and things like that, which I, you know, I, I've written papers on that, on those things too. But I didn't, I really wanted to be a professor. Um, that's what I was getting my PhD for. You know, I could have, I could have gone to, to the financial industry and not bothered with a PhD. Although having a PhD in finance is, is still an entree into a good job and in the financial industry, but it's, it's not necessary. Uh, so I, yeah, I wanted to be a professor. So I, you know, I, I had job offers from several universities after when I graduated from Chicago and I picked Carnegie because it was, according to my advisor, Gene Fama, it was the best of the ones that I had available. I could have gone to University of British Columbia to, uh, I don't know, Wharton to a few other places. I can't even remember where. Carnegie oh, Mellon was considered better than Wharton? It was from research, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. For uh, Now, that may have been Fama's opinion. You know, I'm not saying that everybody shares the same opinion. Uh, I had another uh, one of my one of my co-students at the same year in Chicago did go to work, Marshall Bloom, and he spent the rest of his career there. Mm -hmm. uh, so it wasn't that you couldn't go to Wharton. It's just that you know, Gene advised me to go to Carnegie. Anyway, I could have gone to Cornell. And they offered me a job. I went there for a job interview, and I arrived in the middle of a blizzard. <laughs> and I thought, well, Pittsburgh can't be this bad. Right? <laughs> yeah. Dick, what was some of the research that you did during the Carnegie years? What was some of your key work? Well, I did I did um, several papers on interest rates, which followed my 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 doctoral dissertation. I got that published as you know when I was the first year I was at at. Uh, at Carnegie, and that won the prize, you know, the first, the best dissertation in economics. But, but then I worked on a, a number of different things. I wrote a paper on gun control, one of the early papers on gun control, uh, which is not finance at all. But I got, you know, I'm kind of a data slut in a way. You know, I, if if you got a lot of data, you know, I like to dig into it and see if I can figure out any patterns that you know might be interesting to data so i i wrote a i wrote a paper on gun control which i still think is a pretty good paper in fact some of the recent studies on gun control have really corroborated this paper it was published in the law journal the duke law journal uh, and what we found was that uh what the data were the following they were local ordinances against gun control and state ordinances against gun control back in the 1970s. And so we we tried to correlate those ordinances with rates of homicide, suicide, aggravated assaults, robberies, and things like that. And what we found is that um, the, the more strict the gun control had very little effect on homicide rates, but it really had a big effect on suicide. It actually decreased the suicide rate dramatically. And it raised the rate of aggravated assaults. And here's the reason. When you have gun control, you try to kill somebody with a knife, it's not as effective. So you have a gun, you're more likely to succeed. 
But an aggravated assault is basically a an attempt an attempted murder, but with some something that's less effective than a gun. So what people do is they substitute other weapons and they're not as not as effective. But it has a big effect on suicide, which is I, I read just recently at Berkeley there's another professor now that's still doing these kinds of studies and they they also found gun control has a big impact on suicide, but not so much on uh, on homicide. And of course it, it has very little impact on stuff like robbery and things like that, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm not sure whether that still holds today. But, but then I did I did a paper that really made my career, which was a, uh, a study of empirical, um, previous empirical papers that have studied the capital asset pricing model, which is the model that that relates the expected return on the stock to the risk parameter of a stock commonly called the beta of a stock. Uh, so there's a there's an equation which says that the expected return of the stock is going to be equal to the risk free rate plus the beta, which is the response of the stock return to the market's condition. So a high beta stock means that when the market goes up, it goes up even more. The market goes down, it goes down. So that beta coefficient, the higher that beta coefficient, the higher the average return of the stock. That's the that's the prediction of the capital as a price to model. It's hard to test though, empirically. There were a bunch of papers that tried to do it. And I wrote a paper which basically criticized these papers and became very well cited called a critique of the asset pricing theories test, which is really, I guess the most cited paper I've ever written uh, in my whole career uh, because it, it really made people stop and think are we really doing the right thing when we test this? It's very technical because the, you know, what they what they were doing is highly econometric. You know, it's very hard to understand unless you're a specialist in this. And so I, you know, I became a specialist as part of my PhD program. And then I discovered uh, after that that there seemed to be some flaws in these papers. And so I published that one. What were the circumstances of moving to UCLA? Were you recruited? Were you looking for new opportunities? Uh, well, I, I didn't tell you that I there there was a there was a, a period where I wasn't that I left Carnegie. I wasn't yet at UCLA. I went to Europe. So I in 1972 I left Carnegie and I went I went to Brussels, Belgium, and was appointed to a place called the European Institute for Advanced Study. Dick, is this to say you, you resigned or you took leave? I first I first took leave from Carnegie and I went to Belgium and I, I went to this research institute in Brussels. The research institute was sponsored by um, nine European countries that had business schools, but very few finance faculty that knew how to do research. And so they they had the idea to put this institute in place, recruit Americans who didn't know how to do research and to serve on the doctoral dissertation committees of students at these nine countries at various universities in Europe. So what they, as a reward for that, they let you do your own research. You didn't have to teach but you did have to go to a country now and then to serve on a doctoral dissertation uh, committee. You were assigned countries. So I had three countries. I had France, Finland, and Ireland. So those are my three countries. So I went every now and then I go to Ireland, to Dublin or to Helsinki. And more often because France is much bigger, I went to Paris or someplace in France to serve on a, a dissertation of some student who was trying to get a a PhD in finance and didn't have any faculty really to advise them. Uh, so, um, so I was there for two years doing that and writing, still was writing papers that I was publishing. At the end of two years, I had gotten to know uh, several people in France uh, at a place called 
Hautetude Commercial, which is Ashe Se. I don't know if you know the place or not, but it's, it's one of the Grande Cole in France, uh, which is one of the schools founded by Napoleon. So Ecole Polytechnique, Ecole Normale Supérieure, they're all those Grande Cole. So what Napoleon did was he had his cabinet members each sponsor a school. So the Minister of Commerce sponsored this school that I went to, which is Haute Etude Commercial Center for Higher Studies in Business. It's it's in a little town near Paris called Jouillon Joseph. They offered me a job and they said, we're going to turn HSA into the world's leading research institute in finance. <laughs> so I said, well, okay, I'll come and give it a try. So they, they, then I quit Carnegie. I resigned. I went to HSC and I was fully what they call in France, agrégé. That is mean you're appointed for life as a full professor in, in France. And in France, in your field, you're ranked from oldest to the youngest. Whenever somebody older than you retires, you can move to that school. If I want to go to the University of Paris, you know, and they somebody retired and I was the next ranking person, I could I could grab that spot, right? <laughs> well, that's what it means to be agrégé in the French system, which I which I was. So so I thought I was gonna spend the rest of my life there. Uh, and I was I was teaching in French, you know, I I'm still fluent in French and I was teaching in French. In those days, they didn't have any English courses, but uh, but what happened was is that I had I had been married previously, and I had gotten a divorce when I left Carnegie. Pretty amicable divorce, but I had two children, uh, and my ex-wife uh, had moved to California with the kids, and so after two years in in Paris, she called me and said she couldn't handle the kids. They were teenagers. And could I please come back and take care of them? Well, they had come to summers to spend with me in France anyway. You know, we'd gone. So, you know, I'd spent a lot of time with them in, in the summers, mainly when they were out of school. So I said, all right, I, I guess I better do this. And so I called up a, a professor at UCLA named Fred Weston, who was the leading guy in finance, I said, Fred, I knew Fred. I said, Fred, you know, I need a job. Can I, can I, can UCLA give me a, a job? He said, oh man, we'd love to give you a job. <laughs> so, so I went to UCLA and my kids moved to LA and went to high school here in Culver City. Uh, and by that time I'd been married to my second wife and she had two younger children, but we were, we were in uh, Paris, you know, together. And she told me that if I moved to LA, you know, she wasn't going to go. And I said, why? There are too many blonde divorcees in California. I don't <laughs> want to. <laughs> but believe it or not, I said, well, I, I said, I'm going to have to go. So I'd like you to go if you, you know, she went. And six weeks after she got here, she said, I'm never going to leave this place. <laughs> and my, and her daughter, my, my stepdaughter, who was in grade school in, in a French school, uh, in, in our little town in France, you know, said, I don't want to go to America. I'm French. She says, I'm French. <laughs> so we said, I tell you what, you know, we get to LA, you can go to the Lycée Francaise. There's a French speaking school here in LA, right? She went there for several years and then finally got used to it. And so she and her little brother, all of them actually went to grade school and high school right here. And by the way, that daughter, that stepdaughter went to the University of Chicago undergrad and MBA. Oh, wow. Another member of the Chicago school in the family. Yeah. And, and her daughter, my granddaughter, is at Chicago right now. Wow, family she business. And her brother, her little brother, you won't, you won't believe this, he's at Auburn 
studying aeronautical engineering. Oh my goodness. <laughs> That's great. That's like an academic version of 23andMe. <laughs> Dick, what was your home department when you got to UCLA? It, business school, finance department. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So it, the, it's the uh, now it's called the Anderson School. When I went when I went to UCLA, it hadn't been named Anderson School; it was just a business school. Um, but of course, I knew a lot of people in the economics department too. Uh, like Armin Alchian and Harold Demsetz and people like that were good friends of mine. And Clay LaForce, who was the chairman of the economics department, was and still is a very good friend of mine. In fact, in October, in November 2019, right before the pandemic, Clay and Barbara LaForce and my wife and I went on a Mediterranean cruise together, 14 day cruise. So he is still a very close friend of mine. He was the head of the economics department when I went to UCLA, and then he became dean of the business school. So he was dean of the business school for a long time while I was a professor there, and he and I were really good friends. He's 91 years old now. You wouldn't believe it. He looks like he's 60. That's the amazing guy. Dick, what was your reaction in the mid-late 1970s to the stagflation and economic malaise? Did you work in areas that you saw as responsive to these broader problems? No, that's macroeconomics, the stagflation. That's What that is, is has to do with what's called the Phillips curve, which uh, prior to the stagflation episode in the 70s, there was a a lot of research done by macroeconomists who claim that full employment is related to higher inflation. So there's a curve which says that if you've got a higher inflation, you get less unemployment. That's the so-called Phillips curve. I don't know if you, have you heard of that? I have, yes. Yeah. Okay. So that Phillips curve um, was widely believed by Keynesian economists. The, Phillips was an, an English economist, I think. I, I don't know him personally, but um, so he published, the, the, I guess, the first paper on this where he he studied different periods and, and tried to show that, that you get more employment or less unemployment if you have higher rates of inflation. Now, when I was at Chicago, even before the 70s, in the late 60s, Milton Friedman, talked about that in, in his class and in, in, in the money workshop that I would attend in, in Chicago and, and claimed that this was a lot of baloney and said there was no such thing as a Phillips curve. And, and he based that on international evidence where he looked across countries and couldn't find any relation between the inflation rate in the country and the unemployment rate. I guess in England there was a relation, but England may have been the only place, or maybe, anyway, there were a lot of people that thought that was the case. So stagflation was the result of the Phillips curve not working in the late 70s. That's what it meant. So the the government in, under Jimmy Carter in, produced high inflation, but the, but the unemployment rate was also high. So it didn't work. Right? which is what Friedman had been saying all along. And, you know, theoretically, there's no theory behind this. I mean, it, unless you, unless a theory is that but psychological, that people don't understand inflation and are fooled because they think they're getting higher wages when they're, when they're not really getting higher wages, they're just getting higher nominal wages, but no more high, high real wages. That's, that's the only theory behind the thing. So if, if you believe that people are not complete idiots, you know, they're not going to fall for it. <laughs> and, and in the seventies, they didn't, you remember that in the late seventies, we had, we had 15% interest rates. Treasury bill rates were 15%. I remember my parents, their first, their first interest rate when they bought a house in 1977 was I think 15.2%. Yeah. So one thing we know about interest rates is that inflation does affect interest rates. It may not affect unemployment, but it definitely is going to be in, in, in an interest rates because if you lend money 
if you lend a hundred dollars to somebody and an inflation rate is 15 percent you're going to get back 85 dollars even if you earn nothing right in, in in purchasing power so you've got to charge 15 percent interest rate to make up for that so you know it, it's very clear that that interest rates and inflation are strongly correlated and I mean, that's that's true every country in the world in every single period and in and, and so on so you know 1979 interest rates were 15 and a half percent and paul volcker got into the federal reserve and he lowered it to dramatically right and they did it without having any impact whatsoever on employment <laughs> that's the other thing <laughs> so so you know if if you look at if you look at 1979 that was kind of the peak of of, of the inflation rate by 1983 or 84 the inflation rate was down to you know two or three percent and interest rates had fallen from 15 percent to four percent or five percent right so so the real interest rate which is the difference between the nominal rate and the inflation rate it was always only two percent right so if you if, if you get the nominal rate is 17 percent the inflation rate is 15%. That's a 2% real rate. Later, the interest rate is 4% and the real and the inflation rate is 2%. The real rate is still 2%. So if you look historically over the entire lifetime of when we've had data for, for interest rates, the real rate of interest hardly ever goes above 1% or 2%. It's almost always below 2%. In most cases, it's below 1%. So even today, you know, we, we now we've got inflation that's suddenly is heating up to let's say five percent. The real rate of interest, let's say the re, the rate of interest on index bonds. Now we have these index bonds, right? Inflation index bonds, the government's issued. The real rate of interest is still one percent. You know, it has always been one percent. It's always going to be one percent. <laughs> but the nominal rate of interest can be anything. I mean, some countries have hyperinflation, right? So that Brazil, their interest rate, I think today is something like, you know, 35%, right? And there have been many countries that's even been higher. Like Germany in the Weimar Republic, it, you know, the rate of inflation became something like 10 to the ninth, right? So they couldn't even use the money anymore. The, the, there's a famous story about, you heard this story about a German going to the bank with his wheelbarrow full of, Marks. Sure. Somebody sure. robbed them. They didn't want the money. They wanted the wheelbarrow. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> Dick, tell me in the in the nineteen eighties your 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 paper, the hubris hypothesis of corporate takeovers, and more generally your interest in mergers and acquisitions and takeovers during this period. Yeah, well, that's a paper I was talking a little bit about before, where, you know, if you have Microsoft believes they can, that Yahoo is worth more than the market price. The CEO of Microsoft, if they're infected with hubris, that means they're overconfident. And they really believe in their own valuation more than they believe in anything else, right? That's where the hubris came from, because it, hubris means overweening pride and confidence, right? So in arrogance. So if you if you make a valuation of a of a target and you believe your valuation is absolutely right and you don't pay any attention to what other people are saying, that's hubris, right? And you're going to make a mistake. And so that paper was first laying out the psychology of why that happens and then pointing out that whenever you make a mistake that's negative, if it's below the market price, you never observe that observation because there's no acquisition. There's no, there's no takeover bid because nobody's going to make a takeover bid that below the market price. They're only going to make it when it's above the market price. Right? So right away, the bids are biased. They're biased high by the psychological people that, that have come up with, it doesn't mean that on average people make erroneous bids. It just means uh, erroneous valuations. You know, half the time you your value is below the price and half the time it's above the price. But if you believe when it's above the price that it's right, 
you will make it you will make a, a takeover attempt but if it's below the price you won't even try because nobody would accept that that bid so that right away you see that there's a bias in between the the target price offered by the acquirer and the market price caused by the hubris of the ceo Tell me about your collaborations with Stephen Ross. What made that such a productive relationship? Well, the first thing that made it such a productive relationship is, is he was an absolutely an absolute genius. So I was just lucky to have him as a co-op. <laughs> <laughs> so the uh, and and he also became one of my best friends i think the best friend i ever had in my life and he always called me the best friend he ever had in his life and we got together initially because i went to he was at wharton he went to harvard but not in not in finance he was in the economics department which is a good department so sharp didn't advise him not to go to harvard but he went to harvard and he studied international trade which is kind of a sterile field, you know. He, he, his first job was at Wharton. And when he was an assistant professor at Wharton, I was an assistant professor at Carnegie. And I went to present a paper at Wharton. They invited me to come and present a paper. I think it was a paper I wrote on the asset pricing model. And he was interested in trying different fields because he wasn't very, he wasn't very keen on international trade theory, which is what he was in. So he came to my, he came to my workshop and he liked the paper, right? So the next week they had another speaker at Wharton. It was Fisher Black who invented the Black-Scholes option pricing model. And Steve went to that seminar too. Mm -hmm. And he said, after those two seminars, I said, if those are typical people in finance, I'm going to get into this field because, you know, those are the smartest people I've seen in a long time. And so um, I didn't know that. He told me that later, you know. Uh, but when I, when I left Carnegie and went to Europe, it turns out that he also went to England at the same time, but only for a year. But when he was in England, he wrote a, an incredible paper on the arbitrage theory of asset pricing, right? Which he sent me, I was in France and I, I read the paper and it's, it's a fantastic paper. And, but it's theory. It's, it, and Steve is a complete theorist. He, he's, he, he and I would always argue because I'd always say to him, Look, the empirical guys like me have to discover something weird to give you theorists something to talk about. Right? Otherwise, you won't know what to write. <laughs> and he said that, but his paper on the arbitrage theory of asset pricing was a, was the first multi-factor paper on asset pricing, and it was it's a brilliant paper, not only in its theory because it's it's very very elegant but it also is practical in the sense that you could use the arbitrage pricing model to devise optimum investment portfolios so when i when i got the paper read it through i called him up in london from 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 brussels and said you know steve this paper is fantastic but we need but it needs to have empirical work done so how about if you and I work on empirically fitting that paper in your model? He said, that's great, sounds great. So he came over to Belgium and we worked a little bit. I went to London, worked a little bit more. So by, it took us a long time to get it done. And by the time we had a, a working paper going, I had gone back to California and he had gone back to Wharton and we decided we'd spend the summer of that very first year back in America in Vancouver, because we'd been invited by the University of British Columbia to spend the summer there. They often did that. They invited people for the summer. 
So Steve and I went to UBC for the summer and we finished that, that paper. It got it published in the journal of finance not long after that. And it was a, it is one of the most widely cited papers in finance, but that wasn't the end of the story because <clears throat> we realized that, <clears throat> that we could use the results in the paper and in his theory to start a money management firm, except that neither of, neither one of us knew how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> in the meantime, I had, I had gone to Goldman Sachs, you know, and we started a money management firm that had no clients. And we got a junior partner who was a lawyer in Philadelphia. And I started producing portfolios, you know, paper portfolios, nothing with real dollars. And, you know, we worked on this and, and we got it going and everything. And we got a client. Steve went to talk to somebody and unbelievably they gave us money to invest in this thing. You know? So we started a company called Roland Ross Asset Management. The people at Goldman Sachs, the partners and everything knew I was doing that. I wasn't trying to pull the wool over their eyes or anything like that. So um, the, the next year I was still at Goldman Sachs out of, the, out of the third year and we got some more clients and I started you know, taking a few days here and there and going to visit clients and building portfolios and stuff like that. At the same time, I was doing mortgage-backed securities for Goldman. The third year, <clears throat> we had gotten maybe seven or eight clients. We had maybe a billion dollars by that time. And um, so Goldman Sachs said, we have Goldman Sachs asset management here and nobody knows how to run it. How about if you and Steve take over? Mm -hmm. I said, okay, that sounds good. You know, Goldman Sachs asset management with all these people out in the field. So take off. Oh, the, the, take the microphone thing again. I'm sorry. I said, I'll do it. Steve wouldn't do it. He says, I don't want to work for anybody. I said, you're crazy. These are great people. I love the people at Goldman Sachs. You know, look at Steve Freeman, Bob Rubin, the guy who came treasury secretary. You know, they're, they're, they're wonderful people to work for, you know. And uh, no, not going not gonna to have a boss. So that was the end of that. So then I decided, well, we have Roland Ross Asset Management, and I have Goldman Sachs, mortgage-backed securities, I got to choose between the two. So I picked Roland. I, I told the Goldman partners I was going to quit and go back to UCLA and work on Roland Ross, you know, while I was in California. So we, we, th by that time we had offices in, in Philadelphia, in Bluebell, Pennsylvania, and in New Haven, he going to Yale. So we had an office in New Haven and then I started one in Culver city. And then we ran for 20 years, we ran Roland Ross asset management where I did all the portfolio selection in Culver City. I had several people there on the staff. Alan Juhas in Bluebell, Pennsylvania did all the trading and Steve did all the client interactions. He did all the, he was the guy that went out and solicited the money. Uh, I did occasionally, but I was not as good at it as, as he was. He was very persuasive. So then we had a 20 years went by and we made a quite a bit of money from this company, but it was still a little, you know, a little company. Maybe we had 15 employees total, something like that. Uh, it, I mean, a money management firm is a very good firm. If you have clients, I mean, there, there's hardly any expense. It's all revenue. So, you know, you're making, you're charging people 50 basis points of the money they put in, which means a half a percent. And if they put in a hundred million dollars, you know, think about it. It's a, it's a good business. You know? If it's a great 